How has the past decade of upheaval in the Arab world been experienced at ground level? What are the key developments and issues in the region that the international media has overlooked or ignored? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program on current events, policy questions, and new ideas. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Nabih Boulos of the Los Angeles Times. Nabih Boulos is a Middle East Bureau Chief of the Los Angeles Times. Since 2012, he has covered war, revolution, and upheaval throughout the region, including the expansion of the Islamic State movement and the campaign to defeat it. His work has taken him to Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, and elsewhere in the region, as well as on the migrant trail through the Balkans and Europe. A Fulbright scholar, Boulos is also a concert violinist who has performed with Daniel Berenboim, Valery Gergiev, and Bono. Nabih Boulos, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Nabi, you began covering um, the Arab upheaval in 2012. By that time, the region was aflame with mass protests. Syria and Libya were engulfed by armed conflict and foreign intervention. Um, Egypt had experienced a democratic transition, soon to be terminated by a military coup and so on. Um, amidst all this hope and despair, what were your key impressions? What stood out most for you in terms of particular events or individuals during uh, this past decade? Well, in terms of events, actually, um, I mean, I can just think of these, these sort of momentous events that occurred at different points in time from, from August 2012 when I started and all the way up to now. I mean, for example, I can think of the time uh, in Homs when you saw the first sort of reconciliation deals that were being done by the, by the Syrian government with the rebels. And of course, you know, these are, these are also seen as uh, you know, surrender or, 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 you know, or starve agreements, basically. And we got the chance to see people who had basically been besieged in the old city of Homs for months at that point, uh, you know, being forced to leave in, in, uh, in some acceptance of the deal, for example. I also remember this other time when we were in Aleppo and I saw that, and that's for the Syrian war, of course. But then I also got the chance, as you mentioned, to see the expansion of Islamic State, of the Islamic State, uh, really, in, in 2013, when it was already a spent force, to this uh, resurgent, uh, you know, massive jihadi threat, and you know, I saw, you know, all the fight actually in Iraq uh, for the beginning of it, you know, where you saw it, basically these small villages, and leading all the way up to the end of the Mosul offensive. I've also gotten the chance to see the withdrawal in Afghanistan, although that's perhaps less perfectly related to you know, the Middle East, but. Uh, I mean, I guess the central theme in all this is that you've seen so much, uh, as you said, hope and despair, but also so much waste. And I have to say, I mean, throughout, you just get the sense that that all of these sort of hopes were frustrated because they were essentially, I mean, at the end of the day, when you see or when you think of the Arab Spring, uh, there were some essential points, I think, that that were perhaps now, you know, they're now perhaps forgotten, which is that you wanted the state to treat you with some dignity, that, right, that it wasn't a nanny state. And there was a lot of that in the sense that you know a lot of the a lot of protests were about uh, you know empowering actually grassroots movement or empowering people or empowering some sense of the citizen as opposed to the leaders, which has always been the case, right? This notion of of stability with this leadership in a certain way, but no representation. And then finally, you had the sense now in the Arab Spring or at the time, you know, that there was a desire for some kind of real representation. You know, if you have to uh, you know be part of this country, then you know actually be part of it properly. And then just to see that all destroyed throughout, right? Whether it was in, in Syria, whether it was in Iraq, whether it was in Yemen. And I was struck all the time really by, by, by how sad it all was at the end of it because you know, it, the, it seemed like the best chance for these people was to leave. And you saw that very often. I also had the chance to go on the migrant trail. And I remember seeing these people reaching Vienna and being welcomed by, by, you know, by the Austrians there. It was just it was just flabbergasting this 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 outpouring of welcoming that was happening, and this was all a result of the Arab Spring at some level. These people had to leave their home, and they had to go elsewhere, and they seemed to be more welcome there, at least you know at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me as such a waste, really. And, and now, I mean, looking back from the vantage point of of twenty twenty one, these hopes and aspirations that you were describing, do you feel that they 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 are still a motivating force or 
has the hope been crushed out of people um, by, by the conflict, by the economic difficulties, most recently by the pandemic? Crushed is perhaps a good way of saying it, but, but, but maybe perhaps it's been sort of beaten out of them, right? It's been, it's been slowly, you know, across the years, just ground out of people, right? Just this belief in, 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 in the possibility of change in a real sort of intrinsic way, right? That I think has been ground out of people. You definitely see that in the Arab Spring now. Um, and for a lot of people, really, it, it's just become a matter of, you know, I mean, I mean, do you want to have these sort of, uh, I mean, do you want to fight for these higher rights, perhaps? But also, do you want to have stability? Do you just want to send your kid to school and have them come back safely? And, and, and you can be sure that they will be, right? These have become the sort of the essential questions. We've been reduced to that level at some level, right? Where, where, where you need to have these sort of, you know, very, very basic security issues answered first before people are willing to even venture into something higher level at this point. And that's a function, again, of what's been happening over the last uh, 10 years now, really over the last you know, few decades in the Arab world, but especially in the last decade where you felt that people really just want some form of stability, even if it involves a deal with a perhaps not the best regime in the world or the best government in the world, still, you just want some stability. And that's what happened in Afghanistan, for example. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because initially, I, I think many people would say, well, um, you know, we need to change our government. Um, we need to have a democratic opening or whatever so that we can have proper economic development and jobs and, um, and so on. But 10 years on, it seems you're saying they're making very different connections in this respect. I mean, again, you have to look at places like Iraq, you have to look at places like, like Syria as well. I mean, I mean, the you know, the will to fight against some kind of a, some kind of a government, you know, in Syria is, is really mostly kept alive in, I guess, at this point, really just, just a diaspora of some sort, right? The, and especially the politicized diaspora, you know, the opposition, etc. But in reality, a lot of people in, in Syria at this point, you just feel that they want to move on. In Afghanistan, it's much the same, for example. I mean, I mean after, you know, four decades of war, people might not be enamored with the Taliban, but, but they certainly prefer that over the state of constant war that was there just before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the U.S. constantly bombing and, and fights between the Afghan government and the Taliban throughout. And you look at places like Libya as well. I mean, I mean, at this point, you know, people perhaps would even wish for the return of some form of Qaddafi, right? We've heard all these rumors about Saif, uh, you know, you know, Saif al-Islam, Qaddafi trying to return. And this is a function of people, I think, prioritizing, uh, you know, some kind of stability over these higher ideals, right? Over these it higher seems ideals. And that's just a function, again, of being ground down. It seems almost but, like um, a, a type of nostalgia for that which they were determined to change. Of course, because, I mean, at the same time, you think of what happened back in those times, right? It was, it was much more stable. There was some economic, uh, I mean, maybe not prosperity, right? But, it was, but it's better than now, especially post-corona. There's just been really a, 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 it's just been a panoply of crises for the Arab world. And you get the sense that it hasn't had the chance to, let's say, recover from any of these crises. I mean, for example, we thought in 2018, for example, that things would calm down a little bit in, in, in Syria, in Iraq, et cetera, that you had some way of moving on from, from the horrific Arab Spring revolutions that caused that, that well, I mean, not the, not the horrific Arab Spring revolutions, of course, but I mean, the, you know, the, uh, you know, the horrific aftermath and the aftershocks that came, right, whether it was ISIS or whatever. And then, of course, that all turned back. You know, we, we saw that, that it remained the same way. And now we see that the Arab world is actually, you know, uh, so much more vulnerable to all the shocks that, that are facing uh, I mean, humanity in general, whether it's the climate change, whether it's corona. We see that the Arab world in general is actually just, just really more vulnerable, I have to say. And that's worrisome. So uh, you, you mentioned um, the Islamic State movement and... Um, as, as we were saying before, you covered the rise and fall of, uh, of the movement's territorial conquests, uh, basically from start to finish. And I'm recalling um, a presentation you gave a few years ago at the American University of Beirut, in which the main point you were um, trying to convey was to emphasize that this movement was out to establish a genuine state um, with the real bureaucracy, um, real administration, and so on. So I think it would be interesting, you know, from your perspective, how was this exactly um, uh, manifested? I mean, what, you know, did you, 
feel that yes, this is in a sense a state like any other. Put aside, you know, the character of the people um, uh, running it and and their program and so on. But in terms of at ground level, in terms of people's daily lives and administration and so on, how how did that operate? Well, so of course, uh, I mean, the easiest way to talk about this is through its bureaucracy, right? I mean, and of course, I should actually backtrack first and say that that I was thinking about Islamic State at the time, or let's just say ISIS to make life easier, but right? I was thinking of ISIS of the time in t- terms of the context of the Syrian civil war, where you had many, many factions, really, really dozens of rebel factions, and uh, they were acting very much as militias, right, right, as, as, as actual sort of rebel groups, right? And ISIS wasn't. ISIS was behaving much more in the sense of a state, which is to say that it was trying to take control of areas that it was in, right, uh, sort of sort of imposing its full control, which is to say it, it wanted to oust other rebel groups. Um, it was interested in administering people's affairs. And you would see this in, in, in terms of its sort of takeover of, uh, or, or when it commandeered certain houses, right? For example, it would then, uh, you know, create like a, like a rental agreement, right? And rent these houses out. Um, it would take over fisheries uh, in, uh, you know, on the Euphrates, for example, right? And rent these out. Uh, you would see um, these various leases, right? For tractors, I remember like for a John Deere tractor somewhere near Mosul, I remember reading this somewhere, seeing a contract for this. And it was basically uh, a lease out to a farmer, uh, you, know, you know, with a certain terms, et cetera, with, with, like, with like a, you know, certain monthly amount paid, et cetera, et cetera. And Not all the this, type of uh, function you just, normally, um, you normally connect to rebel movements or insurgents. No, exactly. So, I mean, I mean, I mean, you wouldn't imagine the rebel movement would just be interested in like creating like a form for fisheries, right? But that's what they had. They actually had a proper form with fisheries and they had, uh, you know, like the very things for the ministries that they had uh, and had, of course, the various provinces. I mean, it was all, you know, formalized, right? And, and I have to say in the context of the Syrian civil war specifically, I didn't really see that before, right? Mm-hmm. Now, of course, now, now other movements have tried to impose some kind of order in their area, and the Taliban comes foremost to mind, right? Mm-hmm. But in the context of the series of World War specifically, that was the first time I really saw that. And and now, of course, um, uh, that's all gone. Um, but do you feel that it's it's left a uh, long term um, impact? I mean, uh, you know, the, these were contracts that were signed. Have they all been invalidated? Can people still make uh, claims on the basis of administrative um, acts that were undertaken during that period? I mean, I, I mean, there's difficult questions, right? And, and there are even greater ones. I mean, think of marriages and divorces, births, mm-hmm. deaths that were all registered by the Islamic State. What happens to all that? I mean, I remember actually in the aftermath of the Mosul Offensive, you had really thousands of people just streaming to government offices trying to formalize either a marriage or death, whatever, what have you. And these are essential questions when it comes to property issues. That's even more important, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, you're talking about compensation, you know, for people having to move or, or destruction or what have you. And all these are questions that have not been answered adequately, truly. Mm-hmm. And you see that across the board. Um, I mean, attempts to sort of answer them in various countries, whether it's Iraq or Syria, it, you know, it's left things with a get with a with a political sort of framework, which is to say that that there's a sense that some people are forced losers and others are winners. Um, but but again, there is no good answer to these questions yet, and I think it will take so a long time. So these are lingering issues, in a sense. For sure. I mean, look at the prison situation in Al Hol in Syria, right, with all these ISIS remnants. Mm-hmm. Hell, look at the situation with the Yazidis, right? I mean, I mean, you actually have Yazidis and Turkmen whose kids are still stolen by Islamic State sympathizers, and they're held somewhere in in Turkey, or perhaps in 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 you know in parts of Syria, and they can't get to them, you know, to this day. And we're talking about years after all this ended. Yeah. So, yeah, there are many, many lingering issues, sadly. And um, Nabi, the past few years, you've been mainly based in uh, Beirut, and you were actually in Beirut in August of last year uh, during this uh, horrific uh, port explosion. And I believe you were also personally injured and um, and uh, hospitalized initially. Um, my understanding is that you were rushing to the port to cover what seemed to be a fire when when the explosion hit well uh, i mean it's kind of funny so so my old apartment at the time was actually mm-hmm. overlooking the the silos and the port right the port area where the fire was happening and i actually had had in that apartment a lovely balcony i remember and i was just sort of idly walking out 
and, and I saw this big fire. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, initially I just thought, okay, I mean, it's a fire. It's not necessarily news for the Los Angeles Times. I mean, I mean, of course it would be good for, you know, for local news, whatever, but, you know, I didn't think it was perhaps yet, anyway, a big enough piece of information for it to get, uh, you know, for me to pay to it. And then honestly, what happened was because suddenly, you know, you just, just heard this roar, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it sounded like jet engines at the time. And so we all thought that finally, you know, the long awaited Israeli attack on Hezbollah was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I just rush out to the front balcony of my apartment at the time and I look up and, and then I look downstairs and I see that all the neighbors are doing the same thing. They're all looking up at the sky, trying to see if there are planes. And then I go back and I look at it again, you know, you know, just looking at, uh, you know, the port exposure or I should say the port fire. And I realized that actually it becomes sort of bigger, right? Like the fire itself has gotten bigger. It's, it's more, it's more aggressive. And so honestly, I just went downstairs. I grabbed my motorcycle and, and headed out. And that's about as much as I remember. Next mm -hmm. thing I know, I was, uh, you know, waking up on the highway, uh, you know, on the ground, you know, uh, just on my Head back. By the and I see, well, well, you know, I have no memory to be honest with you. I just don't remember. I mean, to this day, I don't remember. Uh, the six minutes before the blast and about two minutes after are just a blur and they remain to be so. Uh, I mean, I, well, I should say the six minutes before the blast are completely gone, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, and the way I describe it is that basically like my short-term memory didn't switch to my long-term memory. Right. And so I have no real memory of that time. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of just get flashes of the sort of immediate minutes right after the blast and then, you know, a few hours after. Um, and yeah, I woke up, I basically was on the ground. Uh, I. I think I was wearing a helmet at the time. It seems Good clear that you. what happened was, and from what I could piece, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was lucky. I, I think from what I could piece together from the footage that I found and, and, and asking people, et cetera, is that I seem to have arrived at the highway right in front of the port. So in Beirut, there's a massive highway that's just overlooking the port. It's the closest point you can get to without actually entering the port's area itself, which is restricted. And so I must have gotten there. And it seems that as I was pressing the phone to record, that's when the explosion happened because, you know, you see the footage and the footage just basically has, you know, the phone shaking a little bit. And of course it either lands on the camera or, you know, the other side and as luck would have it, it landed on the camera, of course. And you can hear the sound of glass falling and then me calling out at some point, but that's about it. And, and uh, yeah, it was, it was surreal. Um, I got out very, very lucky for all that. I didn't even have a concussion. The helmet wow. was key. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lesson there. And, you know, yeah. at the time, um, given the other issues that Lebanon had been experiencing, I think many observers, um, many Lebanese, uh, believed this was a final straw and there was no way that um, real change could be avoided. But a year on, yeah. it seems it's still um, uh, very much, uh, very much the same. Uh, what's, what's your impression and analysis of of these, let's call them non-developments? Well, I mean, for one thing, never underestimate the determination of Lebanese politicians hoping to scuttle something. That's the first mm -hmm. one. Um, but the other one is that this is a really long-standing problem in the sense that, you know, it's hard, or, or I should say, it's, it, it's really, I think, insane to expect people to change when it's not in their interest to do so. And the fact of the matter is that whether we talk about Iraqi politicians or Lebanese politicians or politicians anywhere in the Arab world, uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, since they have the power, right, since they actually remain to have the both, I mean, both military power and administrative power, so to speak, it's impossible to change anything, right? And so in the case of the Lebanese, for example, you know, the parliament was supposed to have uh, I voted for a new election law, you're supposed to get all these changes, you're supposed to have, a, a, you know, like a financial transparency law, etc., but all these laws would actually work against the parliamentarians themselves. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it's impossible to expect change. And, and though I'll admit to you, I mean, I, mean, I mean, I was swept up in the moment after the blast. There was a real sense of community, people coming together, really from all of the Lebanese, uh, just, just various like, walks of life and, and, and the Lebanese spectrum, I guess, and working together. And there was a real groundswell and a need for change. But you know, again and again, it crashes against the reality of the Lebanese system. And these but systems you, are almost at this point engineered not to change. But I mean, I think, you, you know, you make the point that that the system is is um, past master at self-preservation. But I think many people yeah. felt that this time around there would be uh, 
such overwhelming pressure upon the system from outside it that its hand would be forced, yet that didn't happen. Well, because I think we often mistake, you know, the system, it's, it's, I mean, it's not supposed to function per se, right? The system is basically meant to enrich a certain select few, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why perhaps, uh, I mean, I, mean, I liken it to what's often said about Afghanistan, right? That the, you know, the Afghan government basically was never functional and that it was corrupt. But I would argue that that was the entire point of the Afghan government. Like it was actually set up to be that way to an extent. Mm -hmm. It actually fulfilled its purpose beautifully, right? For the people who were involved because that's what they wanted to do. Right. And in the Lebanese uh, case as well, I mean, I mean, I mean, this sort of rentier state, this kind of funneling of money to certain constituencies, all this basically fulfills what the Lebanese politicians want. Mm -hmm. And so expecting them to now sort of turn around and kill the golden goose, I mean, is a bit much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now turning to uh, Yemen, um, you have had the opportunity to to visit Yemen um, on several occasions. And I think you've. Yeah. You've been able to visit both uh, um, Aden and Sana'a, if I'm not mistaken. I did. Um, I did. That's you know that's that's one um, crisis conflict that does still uh, constantly make it into the news for all the wrong reasons, unfortunately, in terms of the in terms of the um, unprecedented humanitarian crisis and so on, and the intractability sure. of 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 the conflict. Um, have have you? had the opportunity to return there recently. Yeah, I was there actually late last year, in fact. Mm -hmm. I was there in November. Uh, we went to Shabwa, right mm -hmm. before the big offensive now from the Houthis in that area. And and again, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's a classic case of wishful thinking, right? When it comes to these American or or let's say, you know, you know, ancillary American intervention, which is to say that they rely on proxy forces. Um, they try to sort of uh, you know, bring in partners to help out in a certain way. And the fact of the matter is that it often ends up in stalemate where the other side is, is really actually stronger at this point. And so the Houthis at this point are actually stronger than any other group in Yemen, right? I mean, I mean, all the, uh, all the other groups put together are stronger than the Houthis, but the Houthis are now the strongest group. Because the opposition so is, no is so deeply that. divided also. Of course, of course, mm. right? And so there's no need for them to actually negotiate anything. And so you continue to have these sort of feckless interventions of some sort, right, on the part of the U.S. and its allies. And we end up in a situation where there is no stability, right? You just continue war for war's sake because withdrawing would just sort of, you know, expose one's weakness, right, or, or reduce leverage, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. But we continue in Yemen in this horrific situation, maintaining an awful blockade, right, and, and allowing really the Houthis to do what they want at this point, right, even though we are still in a state of war. It's, mm -hmm. again, tragic. Well, you, you raised you raised the point of the U.S. role and and Western intervention. That's certainly um, uh, been the case in Yemen, also in uh, Afghanistan that you recently visited. But you know, it has I think been a thread through um, the entire story of the past ten years. Um, you know, look at what happened in Libya, for example. And I guess the the question is um, whether one as, as a journalist or an analyst, it's at all possible to explain the history of the past decade in the region without giving a place and probably, you know, perhaps even a prominent place to the role of the US and Western intervention. Um, and if you do feel that that's necessary, how you explain that it's often the main element that's left out in, in um, trying to, people trying to uh, explain the region and its developments? Well, I don't know if it's the main element that's left out, but I do think that, that, that the U.S. intervention certainly, I mean, I mean, I think it would be, it would be churlish to pretend otherwise, right? The U.S. intervention has been, you know, whether it was in Iraq, whether it was in Syria, whether it was in, in Libya, whether it's in Yemen, et cetera. And of course, you know, I mean, I mean, all this also goes back to, to, to 2003 in Iraq as well at the time, right? I mean, we're not talking about a situation where the U.S. was a sidelined actor, right? The U.S. was, I think, an important, important actor in all of these situations, so much so that that it actually sort of inspired some parties on the ground here in the Middle East to rise up in a certain way, right? Right. In reaction to that, it it caused other countries from abroad to actually react in a certain way as well, like we saw in Afghanistan and Syria, 
I mean, the fact of the matter is that the U.S. is intervention is a is a primary driver of what has happened over the last a, a decade in the Arab Spring Revolution. Um, and, and you sorry, could argue that. But, sorry, go ahead. And and is this in terms of their direct military role in in overthrowing governments, or does it go more broadly? Deeper. I mean, look at how the U.S. actually supports certain groups. For example, in Syria, right? You would see that that when the U.S. anointed a certain faction or a certain rebel group as the next sort of important rebel group in that area, right? It would, it would either be destroyed or it would get much more funding, right? Uh, or or get much more credit depending on who you talk to, right? And the fact of the matter is that that no, I mean, I mean, the U.S. is essential in sort of anointing groups in the sense that it actually gives them legitimacy or not, right? Uh, similarly, in Afghanistan, right, the moment that the that the U.S. actually spoke to the Taliban in its deal, right, they they gave the Taliban, I mean, both some of legitimacy, but also more importantly, it it gave them a hint that actually they, you know, you know, only had to wait it out, and then the U.S. would be leaving. Mm-hmm. And and so no, I mean, I mean, actually, I think I think I think the fact of the matter is that the U.S.'s interventions, well, perhaps you know, intervention period, I think, has been a problem throughout, right. And just looking back at, 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 at sort of other historic interventions by the U.S., whether it's Vietnam or elsewhere, you're always struck by how little has changed in the rhetoric and how little has been learned. And, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I find, uh, you know, the lot there is to blame is on the analyst class, right, the analyst and, and think tank class. The blob. Because the fact of the mm-hmm. matter is that, what, what, sorry? The blob, as they call it. The blob, the blob, yeah, because the fact of the matter is that they always fail up, right? There yeah. is no responsibility for getting things wrong. They got it wrong in Iraq. They got it wrong in Syria. I mean, I won't name names, but I'll remember one analyst who would actually predict the fall of the Syrian army every four months. He could have actually marked his calendar by what he was saying, you know. <laughs> and 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 of course, I mean, I still have a, a you know a copy of foreign policy from early 2003, or maybe even late 2002. You know, when they talk about when they talk about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and 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 these are people who are still even to this day in the national security and think tank permanent. I just find that to be amazing, right? The yeah. fact of the matter is that we actually have learned nothing, as far mm-hmm. as I can tell. Mm-hmm. And another has the U.S. And turning back again to um, Afghanistan, you, you were mentioning previously, um, you know, that the government was set up to do that because that's what those in government um, wanted to do with their power and authority. But there are also um, uh, Afghans and other analysts who say, well, actually, um, it wasn't only those in power in Kabul who, who wanted it that way, but that's kind of the template with which um, the U.S. sets up client regimes, whether in Iraq or Afghanistan um, um, or, or elsewhere. Is, is that a valid interpretation from what you've experienced? I mean, I'm not sure that I would call that entirely valid, only because I don't think, I mean, I mean, I mean, perhaps some, you know, elements in the U.S. would want it to be that way, like a kleptocracy of sorts, but I don't think that the vast majority went in with that in mind. Mm-hmm. But the fact is that this template that has been used before, this sort of like multi-ethnic or multi-sectarian, uh, you know, unity government setup, mm-hmm. you see that in Iraq, you've seen that in Lebanon, you saw, you saw that in Afghanistan to an extent. I mean, this recipe is for disaster because the fact of the matter is all you're doing is, is turning ministries into piggy banks for certain constituencies, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that you're providing a service. It's not that the ministry is providing a service, right? The Ministry of Health, you know, has no service to provide to all Iraqis in Iraq, right? It's the, it's the purview of the Sadrists, let's say, right? It's, it's for those who are with Sadr. Um, you know, in Lebanon, the government formation was delayed for months, nine months, actually, right? Because there was a question of, as to who would get the finance ministry. And this isn't because the finance ministry actually, you know, is, is so, you know, enamored with financial issues for the country itself, but it's much more about, uh, you know, like this sectarian leader or this politician funneling money from the finance ministry to its constituency. Mm-hmm. And that's really the issue, right, is that, is that these political models that have been foisted upon us, right, whether through war or whether through coincidence or what have you, right, they just don't work. And mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is that we're saddled with them now, you know, for the last decade. Right. Or in the case of Lebanon, you know, obviously longer. In the case of Iraq, obviously longer. But they simply do not work. And the fact of the matter is that people want change, but they can't achieve it because those systems are entrenched. So then I, I guess the, the next question that poses itself is um, how does one overcome the stalemate? Can one overcome the stalemate? That I cannot tell you. 
Mm-hmm. But I can say that 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 the fact of the matter is, it's a question as to whether one wants the U.S. you know or any other actor really, any other sort of foreign actor to have a role in that, right? Well, uh, um, my question. Um, sorry to me, but my question sorry, wasn't. My question wasn't really relating to what the U.S. Um, role should be, mm-hmm. but I mean, for example, you know, given given your travels throughout the region, and the many people you've you've spoken to, is is the impression you get now, for example, one of defeatism, one of um, um, no, we need to do things uh, differently to achieve the objectives and aspirations that were set out um, uh, a decade ago. So my, my question was meant a, a little broader than, than um, right. you know, given, given these log jams that we have, um, whether you know, within specific states and societies, um, to the extent that they've also uh, been, been um, uh, made greater by Western intervention. Um, do people that you've spoken with see a way out mm. Um, and and what is your view of where things should be heading? My view, I have to, well, I should say, first of all, that I've, the people that I've spoken to, no, as far as I can tell, the feeling of change or the or the or the groundswell for you know for major change, you know, there might be a desire for it, but knowing how to forge that path, you know, then all just 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 isn't there. Mm-hmm. And again, I mean, I look at the case of Lebanon, right, where people really, I mean, yeah, I mean at some point you had. You know, a million people, literally a quarter of the population, out in the streets protesting, and nothing happened. Right, and you know, I think that there's a real sense now, not necessarily of despair—that's a big word—but between Corona and the economic downturn and all the problems, you know, at this point, people are really just desperate for some kind of stability. And the notion of change—I mean, they might want it, of course, but again. You know, right now they're still dealing with a with like with like a falling currency, right? They're dealing with getting food on the table. They're dealing with having enough electricity, and with having enough water. You know, these so basic questions that just basically prevent you from actually doing anything higher level. And I think that's the main issue now. And it's an interesting um, take on you know one often here as well. They have nothing left to lose. But listening to you, you seem to be suggesting that those um, who have the least to lose and who are um, the most desperate for just the essential basics of everyday life are probably um, least motivated um, uh, to become activist or militant um, to change the realities they live in. Well, a great example, I think, is about the sanctions situation, right? I mean, I mean, you often hear, you know, pro-sanctions people talking about how that these sanctions would cause a dissatisfaction and then people would rise up. But have you seen that happen? I mean, the fact is you haven't, right? Because people are just stuck trying to provide for their families, right? Mm. And all you do instead is basically make them go through the, like go through these ridiculous loopholes, making it harder and harder for them to actually provide. And therefore they have less and less time to talk about or even think about something that involves bettering their nation or changing the regime or, or government or what have you, right? I mean, this is one of these sort of important fallacies is that, you know, if, when you see people have nothing left to lose, you know, it takes a lot to make someone have nothing left to lose, right? And and for the most part, you know, no matter what you might think of their, you know, existence, right? A lot of people actually do want to preserve something, whether it's simply for their kid, right? Mm-hmm. It takes a lot to get to the point where you feel you have nothing left to lose and therefore you're willing to basically bomb yourself or whatever. But for the most part, people do want some kind of stability, some kind of way to go on with some level of dignity. But you also seem to be suggesting that that poverty and, and inequality um, uh, should perhaps also be seen as effective tools of political domestication. I mean, unfortunately, they are. Right. The mm-hmm. fact of the matter is that no matter what we talk about when it comes to sanctions, right, they have become at this point some way of 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 also, you know, I guess like cutting off any kind of debate. I mean, in Syria, you talk to people who are living in urban areas, and they'll tell you that at this point, the sanctions are being used as a club over our heads. So that even if we have legitimate actually demands from the government, how can they be fulfilled? They'll be like, oh, well, we're, you know, we're dealing with sanctions. You have to accept it, right? right. And so, yeah, of course. And, and you see, for example, in, in other parts of the Arab world, right, whether it's in Lebanon or elsewhere, uh, for example, in Lebanon now they've been offering, uh, you know, they wanted to offer them this, this car so they can get, uh, you know, some sort of gas allowance, right, right at a, you know, at a subsidized rate. And this is basically peanuts at this point that's being thrown for people, right? 
And of course, you're domesticating them like this, right? You basically are buying their loyalty. And the thing is, you end up buying it. I mean, I mean, you end up buying it for such a, you know, a cheap price because the situation has become so dire throughout that even this little tidbit is yeah. is important. Yeah. And um, uh, finally, Nabi, if we, you know, these these events, uh, the, these crises, and these conflicts are all, uh, in most cases, uh, still ongoing. But nevertheless, you know, it has been a decade. Um, and I think one can begin to take stock. And, and, and in your view, what has the main legacy of, of the past uh, decade uh, been? And, and perhaps also to relate this um, specifically to your uh, personal experiences and traveling throughout the region during this time. Well, I think the main legacy has been really setting us back Right. And, and I mean, I don't say this because I wanted the Arab Spring revolutions to fail. No, no, I mean, quite the contrary. I would love to have seen real systemic change. I would love to have seen real representation and, and sort of a real, let's say, shift in what has been a sclerotic uh, few decades for the Arab world. But the fact remains that what we've seen instead has been just, you know, if not destruction, then, then chaos and that it set us back, you know, time and again. And this is not to say that I would want necessarily a situation like in China, where where things are perhaps you know well ordered, etc. But if you just take stock of the various Arab nations that we can look at, right, and look at them now, it's hard to not come away with the impression that perhaps it's better at this point to have a single oppressive rule that's at least functional, mm -hmm. right? I hate to sound like this because it's not what I would want to say, and and it's not what I agree with. But just looking at the situation throughout the last ten years. You have to wonder if that's if that's not the way it should be, at least for now. And and is um, that a common um, is that a common perspective that, that you that you often hear? I I hate to say it, but yes. I mean I mean even in Iraq, and this is not to say that Saddam Hussein was a was a beloved figure, but for many Iraqis at this point, they would prefer to have Saddam Hussein, and it's not because they want Saddam Hussein per se, but because they just simply want to deal with one ruler. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, they want to deal with one situation with one network right not dozens right not mm -hmm. have to navigate all these various groups and the sad part is that if you just think of it a little bit more is that is that you know a functional arab state is almost by its nature an oppressive arab state and that's what made a place like lebanon really lovely to live in for a long time if you had money and you had some uh you know freedom because basically uh i mean there are so many groups fighting each other that you could actually have some semblance of of freedom, of, I mean, I mean, some space to basically exist. Right. Yeah. And of course, now that's going away because it's not so functional anymore. And it's just yeah. really, I mean, I mean, the central sort of legacy that I think of when it comes to the last 10 years, is just that the Arab world has managed to fall back, you know, on these old patterns, right, on these old, on these old behaviors. And the fact is that the world has moved on and we are uniquely equipped to the region to deal with what's coming. So. Yeah. And, and just perhaps to pick up on that, if we were now to um, look a decade into the future, is your expectation more of the same, even worse, um, hope for improvement? I would say probably even worse, because if you look at the situation when it comes to climate change, and I hate to sound so dire, but these are countries whose equations don't work anymore. Right. If you look at Jordan, you look at Syria, you look at Iraq, you look at all these places, these countries existed because they involved a social contract that was about resources versus obedience. Right. Um, and of course, that's predicated on the number of people and the, re and, and the amount of resources you have. Since you have dwindling resources and rising numbers of people, that means that the equation does not work. And that's why, for example, I always find it funny when we talk about Jordanian, uh, uh, you know, Jordanian prime ministers, for example, you know, like Razaz and others as if it matters who's there. Well, like, they're an infinite the resource, the some would say. <laughs> well, I mean, they certainly are, but the equation hasn't changed. The equation of the country hasn't changed, right? And that's the same throughout, right? The equation hasn't changed. It's getting worse and worse, if anything. And so, you know, you know, again, we're just uniquely, in, uh, just, just ill-equipped to actually deal with all these changes. And I'm not sure where it's going to end up. Nabih Boulos, uh, thanks very much for sharing your experiences, insight, and insights uh, with connection. Somewhat dire experiences and insight. But, there you yeah. go. And I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Arij Faisal of the Arab Studies Institute uh, for the technical support of this episode. Thank you very much. Thank you.